plant dies under the sun because it did not have root in itself. Now he said to me that awareness in you of truth is that root that he talked about. Because for a while, each time I would go to that verse, can someone look for that verse? I want you to read it. Each time I would go to that verse, I would always ask him, what are those roots you're talking about, Lord? What are those roots? Because he talks about having root within yourself. And I've always asked him, what are those roots? If anybody gets the just signal to me, so, so we can read it, but being aware within yourself of truth is root within you. And the truth uses that awareness in you as a root to hold on to you. Yes. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but Again, he only for a while. Again. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself. Yet he has no root in himself. And I always ask the Lord, what are you talking about then, Lord? What do you mean by someone has no root in himself? It's, it's that awareness of that truth inside of you. That awareness is like a root that the truth in you holds onto. And so the enemy cannot take that truth out of you because you're too aware of it. Amen. Amen. Does it make sense? Yes. Yeah. Let me use an example. A, a classic example is, say, the enemy tries to attack you with some sickness. The more you are aware that God is not trying to heal you. God has healed you. Amen. Amen. The more you are aware of that truth, that truth has a root within you. Amen. It has something in you it can hold on to. So that even if you feel that sickness in your body, the sickness cannot stay there because the truth in you has a root that it is using to hold on to you. So either the truth leaves or the sickness leaves, one of them is going to have to leave. Oh. <coughs> is it making sense? Yeah. Yeah. That's what the Lord means by you need to have root within yourself. Because when, when Satan comes at you, he's always trying to get whatever truth you have of God. He's trying to get some truth you have of God out of you. That's always what it is. And I keep saying this, that's exactly what happened to Job. Many of you know, I, I keep coming back to this because it's a big deal. The experience Job went through was simply everything he went through, all the attacks he went through, the Lord was, I was sharing this with some people a, a while ago. All, all the attacks that Job went through, it was like a, um, a fake punch. What do I mean? When, when two boxes are fighting, okay, one of them can throw a fake punch. And the other one drops his guard. And then the real punch comes after the fake punch. And it's a knockout. Does it make sense? Okay. Everything that happened to Job was a fake punch. The real punch that Satan was trying to punch was to, was to suck out of Job his love for God. That was the real punch. But Job didn't fall for it. That's why Satan lost the bet. 
Now, one of the reasons why Job didn't fall for it was because his awareness of who God was was, was too great. His awareness of who God was was greater than his pain. Is it making sense? The root in him was too deep for that truth in him to come out. It, it just, it, it had gone too deep. And that's one thing that I constantly am learning from Job. What it means to have truth in you go so deep that hell itself comes at you but it literally cannot make you fall. So, so let me say this. I had a dream this week. And he said something to me through the dream. Two things. He said to me, I am greater than your sin. Let me give the background of the dream. The background was, in this dream I saw someone struggling with a sin, with a, an addiction. And they were literally like on the fence. Should I sin? Should I not sin? Should I sin? Should I not sin? Should I sin? Should I not sin? They were literally, they, they were literally on the fence struggling with this thing in them, this, this yearning, this desire in them. To do it or not to do it. To do it or not to do it. And after I had that dream and I woke up and I was talking with the Holy Spirit early in the morning, and I, was, and I was asking him, Lord, what is this? What are you saying to me? The first thing he spoke to my spirit, he said to me, I am bigger than your sin. I'm repeating because I wanted to go into you. He said to me, I am bigger than your sin. And he reminded me that that's why I destroyed it, because I am bigger than it. And the Bible says it clearly that he condemned sin. Meaning he's saying, I destroyed it because I am bigger than it. That's why you have the right not to serve it. Because I am bigger than it. That's what you're saying to me. Because I am bigger than it, you are justified not to serve it. Because I am bigger than it. If I am bigger than that, then it cannot be your God. It cannot rule you. You cannot say, I cannot get rid of this. No, it's a lie because I am bigger than it. Amen. Second thing he said to me is, I am bigger than your desire for that sin. Amen. <laughs> Let me repeat, he said to me, I am bigger than your desire to sin. And he went to explain to me what it means. He said, simply, if I'm bigger than your sin, then your loyalty should be to me. Because I'm bigger than that sin. <coughs> so your loyalty should shift to me, not to it. You keep going back to whatever you're going back to because you, you do not understand how big I am. Let me ask you a question. Who, who here knows The Rock? An actor. The Rock. Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> Dwayne Johnson. Yeah. Now, if if you were going to take a walk at night and you wanted someone to escort you, Okay, 
let me use myself. <laughs> if you wanted to take a mile walk at night and you needed someone to walk with you, would you pick me or Dwayne? <laughs> Let's be honest. Come on, it's okay. I love you. What about you, Sam? In your spirit, I'm going with Sammy. Amen. Amen. That's the most honest answer I can <laughs> Oh, I love you. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But, so, but, <laughs> to the point, it's so tempting to ask Dwayne to walk with you just because how huge and menacing he looks. That's it, say that. And he was saying to me, that's why I saw that guy in the dream. Wavering between sinning and not sinning. Because he doesn't understand who is greater. Yes. This makes sense. Mm -hmm. That wasn't part of message, but it kept coming to me. So I, I, I felt my spirit, I needed to say that. So, back to being aware. The reason why he had me start with this about being aware is, what I'm about to share with you grace of God help you to see a truth this morning but the onus the responsibility the accountability is on you to go home and walk in that awareness I can't do that for you what the Lord has put in my spirit this morning I can help you see it but if you do not go home and walk in that awareness then it, it was of no point you hearing it in the first place. Is it making sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's start with First Corinthians six seventeen. First Corinthians chapter six. Yeah. First Corinthians chapter six. Verse seventeen. This is our core scripture for today. We're gonna to keep coming back to it, but we would visit all the scriptures, but this is our core scripture for today. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Let's say that together. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Let's say that one more time. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. One last time. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. How many, how many, the word is, do you see in that phrase? Two. Two. Two, right? So there are two things that God is saying there. There are two identities of who you are in that phrase. Can you see the two of them? Can you see the two? Mm -hmm. yep. What's the first one? Joined. You're joined unto the Lord. Second one? Spirit. You're one spirit. Again, what's the first identity that God is showing who you are? Joined, joined unto the Lord. 
you are joined to Lord. Second one, you are one spirit. There are some things. Now, this morning, we're only scratching the surface of how deep this thing goes. And I want you to go and meditate on it even further. Because scriptures like this, I take them and the way the Lord speaks to me is I take scriptures like this and I start saying them to myself again and again and again and again and again and it, it, it starts to, it's like a door that starts to crack open and it starts to open and the Lord begins to speak to you through scriptures like that. The first identity that God is showing you here is you are joined unto him. And the next one is you are one spirit. It's not a theory, it's a reality. Let me show you how real this is. The first one, being joined unto the Lord. We know what that is, right? It is literally, it is the same word that is used when a woman marries her husband. That's why the Lord, that's why in Genesis it says, a man shall live his father and mother and be what? Be joined to his wife. It's the same word. Do you see it? So God is talking here about you marrying him. I want you to see that. And I want you to start becoming an awareness that you carry. Not just a scripture you know, but an awareness you carry. He's reminding me to do something, so let me say this. When a, when a young lady is single, she has an awareness of being single. The reason, I'm, I'm sure, correct me if I'm wrong for all the ladies in the room, the reason why your, your wedding days are so significant is because after that day, there's a shift in awareness. You're no longer single. That's why that day is so big for you. Am I correct? Because yes, after that day, there's a shift in your awareness. You're no longer by yourself. You cannot just eat the way you used to eat before. <laughs> you cannot just go out the way you used to go out before. You're no longer alone. There is a change in your awareness. <coughs> the same thing needs to happen to us. And the Lord said to me, let me show you your wedding day. Okay? Go to Matthew 26. back to Corinthians. We go to Matthew 26. Can I have someone read <coughs> loud and clear but quickly verse 26 to 30. Matthew 26 26 to 30. Be careful, can I be right And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many of the forgiveness of sin. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it, 
new with you in my father's kingdom. When they had sung the hymn, they went out unto the Mount of Olives. Okay, can someone now read the next chapter, chapter 27, from verse 24 to verse 50? Again, loud and clear, but quickly. The very next chapter, chapter 27, from verse 24 to 50. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see, it, you see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Uh, then he released Bar Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Uh, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed into his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when he had mocked him, they took the robe off of him and put it, uh, his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Uh, now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon, by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had came, come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothes they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put over, they put over his head the accusation written against him. This is the Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the King of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, some of those who stood there, when they heard it, that, that said, that this man calling for Elijah, uh, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Amen. And the Lord said to me, Those, these verses you read, from the night before to this moment, that was your wedding. I need that to sink in. That was your wedding to Jesus Christ. I want that to sink in. was your wedding. That was your wedding day. That is why he calls you his body. Because that body that hung on the cross is now your body. The same way the scriptures say a man's body belongs to his wife and the wife's body belongs to him. So because that was your wedding, the person that hung on the cross was now your husband. So that body that hung on the cross was yours. And so the body that rose up was yours. And the Lord 
needs this awareness to not just stay on you, but to sink in and for you to walk in this awareness. Can someone read John 13? The Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 1 to 11. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, of, loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil had already put in put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. <clears throat> After that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing, you do not understand now. And you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. One more time, read that sentence again. If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Again. If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Again. If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Because the, his blood that he shed to wash you was your wedding to him. And if you deny that, then you have no part with him. <clears throat> Do you see that? I never understood that statement that he was saying to Peter, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. It's because he was talking about a wedding. Him washing you with his blood is a wedding with you. If you deny it, then you then you have, then you are divorcing him. That's what he was telling Peter. Do you understand? From the night before to the point he said to God, it is finished. That entire process was your wedding. That's what the Bible keeps saying over and over. You are washed in the blood of Jesus. That's what he was telling Peter there. The act he was performing by washing your feet, he was showing them what his blood will do. Literally. But it was... It wasn't just a symbolic gesture. It was an actual wedding. That's why he said to Peter, if you do not allow me to do this to you, you have no part with me. Meaning you and I have nothing in common. But if you allow me to wash you by what I'm about to do for you in the next few hours, if you accept that, it is a wedding between you and I. It is not a symbolic wedding, no. It is a real wedding. That from that moment, he starts to call all of us his body. Not symbolically, no. He actually refers to you as his body. Because the body that hung on the cross was yours. Do you remember the scripture? The husband's body belongs to the wife 
and the wife's body belongs to the husband. Do you remember the scripture? Yes. Let's go back now to 1 Corinthians 6.11. read verse 11. And such were some of you. But ye are washed. Ye are sanctified. But ye now the third thing it says is because of the first two things. What's the first two things? And ye are and ye are Now you understand what that was talking about, right? It was talking about that phrase, ye are washed and sanctified. The Holy Spirit said to me, it was talking about the wedding between you and Jesus. Now, because it's talking about a wedding, what's the very next thing that happens after a woman gets married? She takes her husband's name. Yes. Ah, hallelujah. She takes her husband's name. Read the third thing that happens. Justified in what? In the name of Jesus. And in the spirit. Ye are justified in the name of Jesus. And, and by the spirit of God. So he said to me. It is not just that you are justified from sin. In his name. In his name, you are justified to do certain things. Let me say it again. You are not just justified from sin. You are justified to do certain things by virtue of the name that now you have, not by power of a thing, but by blood. So he said to me, the name of Christ is given to you not as a power of attorney. It is given to you by blood, by marriage. And by that, Thank you, Jesus. according to the bank, okay, Naya should have authority to access her husband's bank account. Legally, she should. That's right. In his name. <laughs> Bill Gates' wife legally should have authority in his name to access his bank account. She is justified in his name to access his bank account. That's what that verse is saying. That verse is saying, in the name of Gates, Bill Gates' wife is justified to access his bank account. In his name. The same is true for you. 
Because now, by marriage, you now have that name. But even more, in God adds another level to that. Even now, the Spirit of God Himself now abides in you. Because of these two things, you have double justification. To do the will of God. Not your will. Because he was saying to me here that there are those who would use this justification and they will stand before him and say, I want you to get this now. They would say, did we not raise the dead? Did we not prophesy in your name? Yes, they could. And they did. Because they were justified to do so. But the Lord said to me, let me say this to you. Priorities are a spiritual window. I want you to remember this. Say that again. Priorities. 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 Priorities are a spiritual window. If your priority is right, you are being, let me read it. Sorry, motives. I wrote it down, motives. But I guess we can put the two together. But what he said to me was motives. But I guess you can also put priorities, but he said to me, motives are a spiritual window. And he explained to me that this is how it works. Motives are spiritual dictates that are dropped in your spirit. If the enemy a motive in your heart it's a spiritual directive if you go with it you have just you have just executed an order from the evil one if God puts a motive on your heart and you run with it you have just executed a directive from heaven Amen. It, it doesn't matter how you heard it the point is your heart hears motives your heart can perceive motives. And if you act on the motive, whatever spirit sent you that directive is the spirit that you've released into your life. Do you understand? Amen. So he explained to me, this is why there will be people who will use the name of Jesus because they are, they are justified to but if their motive is not right, and the last day the Lord will rebuke them. Because the directive, although they were justified to do so, but the, the directive to do it did not come from him. Does it make sense? Oh, yeah. Let me give you an example. A pastor is very successful. And or say you become very successful. Let me use two examples. One ministry and one circle. And you have enough money to buy any car you want. You're able to buy the car. But because you have money to buy any car, the money justifies you to buy the car. But the motive is a directive. Does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Meaning, you could have money to buy a car. So, God blesses you. So, by the financial blessing you have on your life, you're justified to be able to have that car. But if your motive to get the car is to show off, 
If your motive to get a certain house is to show off to your friends, yes, the blessings of God on your life justifies you getting the house. But the motive in your heart was not, was not a directive from God. Is it making sense? This is how motives are spiritual windows that open up access to spirits in life because they are directives that your heart is picking up from the spirit realm. If you run with it, then you're running with whatever spirit is motivating you. Now let me come back to Corinthians 6.11. So we are washed, we are sanctified, that's the wedding. And because now we are wed to him, we are now justified in his name. Amen. Say, I am justified in his name. I am justified in his name. Say it again, I am justified in his name. I am justified in his name. Now this is what this means. It means you have the right to rebuke certain things out of your life. You have the right to order certain things to get out of your life. Yeah. It's not just talking about sin. You must see this and you must become aware of it. It's not just talking about sin. It's, it's talking about much more. You are justified in his name. The same way a wife is justified in the name of a husband to do certain things, to execute certain things. You are justified in his name to execute certain things. Not only in his name, but also by the Spirit of God. So it's a double justification. I want you to grab, grasp, and lay hold of the reality and really what it means that you are justified in his name. It's something that, it's a phrase that I want you to literally say to yourself over and over and over and over till the depth, the weight of what it really means begins to explode inside of you. That you're justified in his name. If you're justified in his name, that means you're justified to do what he was doing. Because There's a verse that I was about to go to, but before I do that, let's look at something else. I'll come back to the because. Let's look at verse 13. I already touched on that, but let's, let's read verse 13. Can someone read it? Verse 13, yes. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. God will destroy both it and them. And the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. Again. That last phrase. The last phrase. Okay. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Do you see that? Do you know understand what that means? It's talking about your marriage to him. I never understood that verse until this morning when the Lord didn't tell me that it's talking about your marriage to him. It's saying his body is for you. 
and your body is for him. Amen. As in a marriage. And that marriage is what justifies you having his name. But here's the deal. We know we do not only have the right to use his name. You have his name. Amen. I need this to sink in. Because if, if you do not understand this, you will struggle with using the name. Many of us just jump to using the name when we do not walk in the awareness of having the name. If this makes sense, yeah. it's like, allow me to use this. It's like Naya goes to the bank to access someone, someone else's husband's bank account. She does not have access to that bank account because she does not have that name. But if, and she does have her husband's name, then now she can use the name. But we always want to use the name without walking in the awareness of having the name. Does it make sense? Yes. It's not a theory. It has to become a reality. To the same way a woman wakes up on her after on the morning of <laughs> wakes up on her honeymoon and reminds herself, my last name has changed. She now has to constantly remind herself. It's the same thing you have to constantly remind yourself that you're, you have an additional name that you took from Christ. Yeah. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 to 10. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth. At that name, all things should bow. Now, hold that truth and keeping in mind what we just talked about in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11. Come with me to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 verse 5. Acts chapter 3 verse 5 to 7. Can someone read it? So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said... Let me give the background. This is the guy at the gate who was healed by Peter. Go on, Jonah. 
Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have... What I do have! <laughs> what I do have, I'm going to give you. Peter was walking in that awareness. Amen. 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 I may not right now, I may not have the cash to give you. That's what Peter is saying. But what I do, what I know I have, I'm going to give you. And what does he bring out? He brings out the name of Jesus. And commands he does not pray. Do you remember the Bible said? You are justified in his name. So Peter doesn't pray. Peter commands the man to get up. Do you see this? I want you to see how Peter was walking in that awareness of having as someone who has become married to Christ walking in the awareness that I have his name Amen. and I'm going to heal this man Amen. I may not have money to give you but I'm married to Christ and I have his name and because I have his name, I'm going to give you something. Amen. I want you to see where a man walks in the awareness of having the name of Christ. Understanding that he has been washed and sanctified. Because he's the same person that Jesus told him that if, if I do not wash you, you have no part with so now he understands perfectly Amen. what it meant to be washed. He now brings out the name and says to the man, Go on, Chantel. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Now, I want you to see this now. Peter was justified to do that. Peter was justified to do that. According to 1 Corinthians 6.11, Peter was justified to do that. So the name of Jesus does not only justify us from sin, it justifies us to do the will of God. It justifies us to tell the enemy, back off. I want this awareness to become something you carry every day, just like you're aware of your name, of your own name. Let me close with this. This was the last thing the Lord began to say to me. Can someone read Proverbs 23, verse 7? Proverbs 23, verse 7. Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. One more time. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. 
One more time. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. One more time. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Here's the difference. Some people may hear this message. But all it will be is a memory in their minds. The reality changes when it does not only become a message you hear this morning. In your heart, you carry it as an identity, as who you are. You think that way. You think that way. You see yourself that way. Because if all authority has been given to the name of Jesus, why is the church not ruling this world? Isn't that a fair question? Yes. yes. If all authority, and it's not a theory, it's a fact. Authority has been given to the bride of Christ. Why is she not ruling this world? Because she's not thinking like the bride of Christ. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. She's not using her authority. She's not using her authority. So the Lord is saying, unless you start to think as the wife of Christ, you will not walk in the authority of his name. I want you to ponder about this. Because the Lord is saying to me right now, as I'm looking at all of you, He's saying to me, this is more than a message, it's an assignment He's giving you. It's an assignment He's giving you. To start to walk as the bride of Christ. And that when you start to see yourself as his bride, you yourself will know. No one will need to tell you that I am justified in his name. <coughs> to move <coughs> mountains. To love in his name. Yes. <coughs> to keep my family together in his name. <coughs> to be Financially prosperous in his name. <laughs> to walk without sin in his name. Amen. To rule over wickedness Amen. in his name. Amen. Because I'm justified to do so. Amen. I am absolutely justified to do so. So we must have a mind shift. Yes. All of us, including myself. Yes. <coughs> including myself. We have to have a mind shift. Yes. Many of us struggle even with believing that God is powerful. Start getting to know the one whom you've married to. Yes. Who whom you're married to. That's, it. That's so good. When you know him, you won't struggle with sin. When you know him, you won't doubt whether you pay your rent next month. When you know him, 
You won't fear sickness. We have some catching up to do, church. Amen. Let's catch up. Amen. Does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Can, we Can we stand? Say with me, I am joined with Christ. I am joined with Christ. His passion. His passion. His suffering. His suffering. The blood he shed. The blood he shed. His crucifixion, His crucifixion was my wedding. Was my wedding. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. His body, His, His body, body belongs to me. Belongs to me. And my body, and my body belongs to him. Belongs to him. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, thank you Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Like Peter. Like, like Peter. Peter. I have the name of Jesus. I have, I have the name, name of Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Tell me, Father. 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 Open up my soul. Open up my soul. Open up my heart. Open up my heart. To the realities. To the realities. Of being the bride of Christ. Of being the bride of Christ. Let me know what it means. 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 Let me see what it means. Let me see what it means. Let me taste of what it means. Let me taste of what it means. Let me experience what it means. Let me experience what it means. Hallelujah. Before I die. Before I die. Before I leave this earth. Before I leave this earth. Let me experience. Let me experience the fullness, Father. Let me experience the fullness of what it means to be His bride. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Walking in his name. Walking, Walking in his, his name. name. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I thank you, Father. I thank, thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.